Thanks for joining us this morning, everybody. Uh, today's uh, presentation is on uh, preparing for return to work post-COVID. So we're going to have a good discussion around uh, return to work uh, for from a business perspective, uh, and also how we tie that uh, to IT and how uh, we make sure technology is ready to enable uh, either a rapid return uh, or a slower return to the office. And what some of the trends and things that we're seeing uh, out there in the industry. So thanks for spending some time with us today. Uh, my name is, uh, of course, uh, Paul Hager. Uh, I'm the Director of Solutions here at Elevity. Uh, and so to our existing clients, welcome. And to those that are new to Elevity, we're uh, the uh, IT arm as a part of the Gordon Flesh Company. Uh, Gordon Flesh has been around for about 65 years. We have offices throughout the Midwest, Wisconsin, Iowa, Illinois, South Dakota, uh, Indiana, and Ohio, and Elevity. Uh, has IT uh, in Wisconsin, Illinois, Indiana, and Ohio. Uh, so great to be here. Um, a little bit of from a agenda setting and expectation setting uh, perspective. We've got about 30 minutes of content here today, so not too long. Um, and we're gonna talk about the state of return to work, uh, some ideas for encouraging return to work and to return to that in-person collaboration. Uh, and since we are a technology organization, of course, discussing how we can align technology uh, to that return to work strategy for your business. Uh, there will be an opportunity to get to today's content and slides. Uh, there's also an opportunity to win a Amazon gift card uh, if you fill out a short survey uh, that we will have the link up for at the end of today's presentation. So uh, look out for that. And once again, thanks for joining us. So always good to kind of level set and just start with kind of a, a state of the state where we are. Uh, as we sit today uh, in the middle of April uh, 2021 versus where we thought we would be uh, maybe a year ago, uh, obviously increased rates of vaccination uh, for the most part declining cases uh, in most portions of the United States uh, has businesses starting to evaluate uh, particularly the, the vaccine rollout and how quick that has gone uh, here in Wisconsin uh, in particular has businesses uh, evaluating uh, their strategy for uh, return to work. Just to kind of uh, level set with some of the industry bellwethers, uh, on April 2nd, uh, Google announced uh, their plan to begin reopening their US offices uh, in April uh, after extended closures due to the pandemic. Um, and uh, most of it just being that the offices are open and that it's a voluntary uh, return to the workforce. Kind of counterpoint to that, Microsoft on April 5th came out and said that they're going to extend their full reopening of its offices is going to be postponed from July 6th until September. And all of Microsoft's events for partners and clients um, all year in 2021 will continue to be virtual. Uh, they've announced that as well. Uh, so kind of differing perspectives we're seeing even amongst uh, the large tech companies uh, in their approach to getting people back to the office. You know, for us uh, here in the Midwest and for the small to mid-sized organizations that are probably joining us this morning, uh, you know, these tech bellwethers and what Twitter has done to make the statements that they'll never need to go back to the office are, uh, while those are interesting and uh, data points to, to think about, uh, probably unlikely uh, to impact uh, what we do here in the Midwest. And it's very dependent on what your business is, right? A predominant number of, the employees at a Google or Microsoft are software developers. That industry is so competitive and uh, you basically have to allow 100% remote workforce in order to remain competitive, uh, vying for some of the top talent uh, and the top developers that are really scarce uh, as we continue to have shortages in the tech industry for really well-qualified people, especially you know those that have very advanced uh, coding and security uh, abilities uh, continues to be very tight. Uh, here in the Midwest, maybe you have uh, remained in the office to some capacity because that's where your work is. You know, we have clients that you know range from the medical industry, which obviously uh, has gotten busier and has has had to maintain a workforce, uh, to 
Uh, we have uh, printing companies in our client base that, you know, the machinery is obviously and uh, manufacturing companies in our client base that the machinery is at the office. So that's where they've had to go. Uh, it's just interesting that, uh, you know, a study that Envoy did here very recently uh, finds that, you know, most employees were, were really trying to embrace more of a hybrid approach to return to work. And I think this just is a data point that 66% of employees uh, worry about returning to the workforce, 16% um, being, or 20% being extremely worried, 16% very, 30% somewhat, 20% not too much, and 13% not too worried at all. So, you know, from a somewhat to extremely worried standpoint, that's a, you know, that's a majority at 66%. That number goes up among Gen Z, so under 25 year olds at the office, this number is up at 75%. So we're seeing different uh, generational approaches. And again, we, we live in this Gen Z, Gen X, millennial, uh, boomer, we live in this multi-generational state uh, within our offices that has some play in how people, you know, feel about uh, the balance of returning to work and their view of pro their productivity while at home uh, and coming back to the office. And kind of on that topic, just to also just to put it out there that, you know, it took us a while to get comfortable to work from home uh, for those of us that worked from home. It's going to take us a while to get comfortable in this new model as well. So this can't be a light switch. We'll talk later about what things most entice people uh, back to the office if this is something that uh, your business is considering and you feel like, you know, in comparison to the year before, you had more productivity and collaboration when people were able to run into each other in the hallway and uh, be able to have some of those ad hoc discussions. You know, for us as a, a company that merged during the pandemic, there's just some process things that while you can talk through them on a Teams meeting, they're just much more evident when you can stand in the warehouse, look at the paperwork and go, you know, this is a challenge that that we're experiencing and then problem solve that uh, together as a team. But I think just reminding uh, your business and your employees that it's a, it's a process and it was a process to, uh, to get used to work from home and it's gonna be a process for us to, to come back whether that's fully back or, or a hybrid workforce. So let's say you're joining us this morning and you're, you're thinking about how uh, we bring uh, the workers back um, or you know, maybe you've had some team members that are work from home and some team members that have been in the office um, and now you want to kind of unify the group. Uh, so what are some suggestions based on what we're seeing as we obviously work with a large number of our clients and in our strategic business reviews uh, with my virtual BCIO team, uh, we're definitely ramping up the number of conversations that people are having with us around advice uh, for uh, return to work. Uh, and we're seeing it all across the Midwest. So I think we have a good kind of pulse on where our SMB clients are along this path to return to work. And it's a discussion that everybody is having. And we're hearing dates anywhere from now uh, to uh, postponing past July even and until there's even more known. Uh, but a lot of people are starting to say with a majority of the state or a large percentage of the state, uh, having had the opportunity to be vaccinated and have gotten through both courses of it and the vaccines being widely available to everyone 16 and older nationwide, that this discussion is really starting to ramp up. So you want your team back. What are some of our advice uh, to businesses that are considering this? Uh, first of all, you know, a one size fits all for every employee likely won't work. Um, it's important to continue as you announce uh, your changes in approach. Uh, we would suggest that you continue to talk about there being flexibility. People have had to change their childcare arrangements. Uh, not every school is back fully. Some schools are still doing A days and B days, and some schools are doing four days a week, and some are leaving at one, and some are dismissing at 3.30. You know, it's just all over the board. Uh, and most of your workforces are probably coming from a multitude of communities. Uh, and because of all that variation, uh, and the variation of people's roles. Some people's roles require collaboration, require or are more efficient when people have direct access to certain pieces of equipment. Uh, and other roles are you know, predominantly using web-based systems that might work uh, in equivalent ways uh, uh, remotely. For the most part, uh, you know, one of the best ways that you can do to combat the anxiety that people are having around that or that worried comment that 66% from that, uh, that previous study had found would be to just give people time. Acknowledge that this is a change, 
uh, and then give them that space to kind of come around to the concept uh, that return to work is going to happen to, in some, some capacity, that there will still be some flexibility, but we have a target date of X date. Uh, and just to note, you know, according to the CDC, you know, from August to February, you know, a proportion of adults that had anxiety or uh, has increased from 36% to 41% nationwide. So, you know, overall, there just is good data that says everyone's anxiety levels are up. I think everyone uh, can acknowledge and experience that. And so when you add in a change, again, like it took to adjust to work from home, the change to adjust to work from office, giving people time, acknowledging that there is some anxiety about it will all help. Uh, make, make it clear who will be with them. You know, one of the driving factors that the study found was when you look at the reasons why people want to come back, uh, a big part of it is they want that social interaction with those people that they spent eight hours a day with every day, right? I mean, our, we, we often sometimes joke about our work family, but it, it really is that, right? In a lot of cases, uh, you spend a lot of time equivalent or more time with your uh, work colleagues than sometimes you do your family. So uh, because of that, one of the key driving factors can be showing that. So in, in our business, what we did is we, uh, we built an Excel document, shared it out into teams uh, of who, when we were in a voluntary comeback uh, to work period that we're, we're still kind of in uh, for the most part here at Levity, uh, we just asked people to fill in uh, with a checkbox what days they'd be coming into the office. And what we saw naturally happen within our own team is people kind of line up to certain days so that they'd have a collaboration day, you know, at least once a week or twice a week uh, with, with certain people. So different businesses have tried different things. The businesses have tried going the A day or B day route. Some have gone, let's be virtual and come in once a month. Uh, to have a touch point um, and with varying degrees of success. You know, I think it's really hard to, to adjust, you know, a once a month uh, is probably really not enough and more probably distracting than it is valuable. Uh, but helping people get into a rhythm, knowing what's expected of them, knowing when their work friends are gonna be there are all ways that you can kind of com combat the anxiety and increase uh, the, top, the excitement and the openness to being able to uh, tackle this change uh, in our lives and in our businesses. Uh, and then I think a good example, you know, Leaders uh, Eat Last uh, is, uh, is an excellent book and uh, this kind of servant leadership mentality has always served uh, our organization well and a lot of organizations. Uh, so, you know, lead by example, start with leaders, uh, start with managers, uh, show that uh, the, the business is, uh, you know, invested in them as employees, but also in their safety and uh, that leadership believes strongly in, in the value of this collaboration. And so they're gonna start first. Um, I think that's a really important message to send uh, to the team that it's safe and it's uh, time and ready to, to come back. Beyond that, you know, suggest maybe getting creative. Think through what uh, perks you had at home life uh, that make have started to make work from home, you know, enticing, you know, maybe we can't offer the ability to, uh, to see your pets all day long and uh, have a dog curled up in the corner while you're getting work done and things like that, or, uh, but you can replicate some of the things, right? Um, you know, I don't, don't know about you, but I've been on plenty of teams and Zoom meetings where the other individuals may be uh, sitting outside or uh, sitting at their couch uh, or, you know, clearly at kind of their breakfast bar. Uh, in their kitchen and there's just kind of some flexibility to being able to work from anywhere within your own home and kind of choosing based on what you have going on that day uh, where the right place to be is and when when the weather is starting to get uh, nicer out here you know the opportunity to you know, especially in tech for us to see sunlight and maybe even breathe some fresh air uh, just adds a level of I think positive energy to being able to get work done. You know, I think for a lot of people, one of the big advantages was just that ability to walk uh, to their fridge, maybe, maybe advantage, maybe a disadvantage, uh, depending on your perspective. Uh, but maybe that's something your business takes into account and says, you know what, we're going to, we're going to replicate some of these things by, you know, changing up seating or changing up, uh, you know, these don't, you don't need to be tearing down walls, but making some investment in uh, being able to replicate 
uh, some of the creature comforts of uh, snacks and, and maybe even sit stand desks. Uh, I've seen a lot of people that have perched their laptop on top of some books on top of a board uh, in their basement uh, to get a quick work from home office set up. Uh, and they kind of like the ability to stand or, or move around or, you know, take a walk over the lunch hour. Those are not, you know, insurmountable levels of flexibility for a business to be able to offer. Uh, and, you know, if it leads to happier uh, and less stressed out employees, it's going to ultimately return to the business and more productivity uh, while still keeping uh, them within the same building for the vast majority of their day and interacting with their coworkers and continuing to evolve the, the company culture. So uh, here at uh, Gordon Flush and Levity, these are some of the things that our leadership team have been proactively uh, talking about. So giving lots of people time uh, as we've uh, targeted uh, a date for our uh, main employees return to work um, beyond you know the team that's likely already here and supporting you. Obviously, we uh, support critical industries and critical infrastructure in cities and towns and medical. And so Levity, uh, by extension, our field team has always uh, been available and continues to and have always gone to, uh, to client sites when needed uh, because IT is a critical part of business infrastructure and as well as we manage security, uh, which is uh, not taking a break in this time. Uh, but just as a, as a thank you, more than a even a, an enticement to return to work since our team is predominantly here. Uh, we're kind of using this as an opportunity to say thank you and uh, offer some of these uh, creature comforts. So, you know, snacks and soda and things like that, and healthy drinks are, are going to be a free offering through the end of 2021 to our team. That just is a, a small little encouragement. And I think in the grand scheme of things, uh, from a cost and, and benefit and return standpoint, you know, I think we will really help uh, our organization and our people as we move forward. So obviously Levity is a technology organization and uh, hopefully you interact with uh, one of our technology leaders. Uh, if you are a part of our Levity versions and you uh, operate on a, you know, a 2.9 or higher version of our offering here at Levity, you likely have some interaction with uh, one of our BCIOs or myself. Um, and so we appreciate the level of uh, integration that you offer us. Uh, we're having this discussion all the time uh, right now about how technology enabled the transformation, uh, the digital transformation to work from home and collaboration over tools like Teams and like Zoom. Uh, and now how do we do that in a hybrid way uh, as teams return, knowing that you know, likely 100% of team at the office is probably just not going to happen in the same way. So just as the tools that work remotely will need to adjust, now the hybrid approach will need adjustment as well. So think about it, if you have a meeting now with half of the participants in per person and half uh, online uh, via Teams, how do we enable a positive interaction uh, versus spending the first five minutes of every meeting, getting a camera set up, pointing it at one person, or how, you know, what are the ways that we can do that? You know, when we went to work from home, we had to adjust and revise processes that were based on, you know, maybe some not super productive methods. Maybe they were very heavy, heavy and moving paper around or things that, while they work really well when you're office, the, they're processes that don't work when you're remote. We gained some advantages to those processes while we were remote. Let's, let's keep all of those things that made us more efficient. Let's not lose any of that uh, as we bring people back to the office. Uh, but let's also not lose the advantages to being in person and giving each other the opportunity to collaborate, have a meeting that's in person. Uh, you know, I gave a presentation uh, earlier into this pandemic that just talked about research Microsoft had done on people on Teams, that there's just a, your brain is more stressed. Like they, they hooked people's brains uh, up to fMRIs and watched their reaction uh, to being in a video call versus being in an in-person meeting. And it is just more mentally draining. Uh, and that's why Teams actually came out with that together mode where you can see people's faces all in one group, which is a more natural interaction versus placed in these boxes and uh, you know all these graphics flying around. Uh, and actually Microsoft did the research that said that that together mode, that human interaction, detecting the nuances of people's uh, interaction and uh, you know, nonverbal forms of communication uh, really do improve. So we, we knew, we know we need to come back uh, because there just is advantages to being able to 
uh, sit across from somebody, especially if maybe if it's a difficult discussion or you're digging into a challenge, uh, there really is just no replacement for, uh, for some of that level of human interaction. So we need to both take the things that we gained using Teams maybe as a collaboration tool uh, or uh, moving into online forms or online approval methodologies and business processes. Uh, maybe you enhanced your use of VPN or remote desktop technologies. You know, those are still things you're going to need to enable your workforce to be able to, you know, hopefully at some point we can all get back to taking vacations and having normal cycles of work during the day and things like that. Teams enabled rooms, I think, are definitely something uh, that you can invest in uh, to enable, you know, what are sometimes called huddle rooms or small conference rooms. You know, I think a lot of us will reevaluate our space needs and get more efficient. Uh, but allow collaboration spaces and knowing now that we're going to be in a hybrid work environment for some time and maybe for a, for the long haul, thinking about a Teams enabled room uh, is probably worthwhile. So what you need for a Teams enabled room is some sort of device to orchestrate the meeting. I think if your expectation is that you kind of have a, a mess of adapters sitting on a table that always seem to walk away, and that people will always come in and hook the right things up every time. Uh, I think people are going to struggle with that and end up just kind of sitting at their laptops uh, in a room uh, versus making a small investment in a Teams enabled device uh, that you can invite that room uh, to those meetings. Uh, just like it's another user, the room will automatically accept that invite if the room is available. Uh, and then all it takes when you enter the room is a single touch on a, a screen, a display, a small tablet, uh, whatever interface that team's room setup has. Uh, that means you can walk into the room, touch one button and join, join on your laptops without audio and start sharing content seamlessly on a big screen to those in the room uh, or you know, uh, to remote screens as well. There are Teams room licenses in Office 365 that enable this kind of calling functionality and Teams uh, functionality without needing, you know, a full license or email account or, or things like that. Um, and then the devices themselves, you know, this is an example of, you know, uh, a setup. This is a, a Logitech rally system uh, added on to uh, any number of uh, quick tablet systems. We also have a have used a lot and use ourselves, um, the Lenovo uh, hub, Surface Hub and uh, Teams Hub uh, device, which is just a small tablet mounted to a Lenovo Mini uh, that sits in the room and does a really good job of kind of staying up to date with uh, what meetings are in the room. And then you can use anything from a small USB camera like, uh, you know, a Logitech HD cam uh, all the way up to, you, you know, PTZ cameras that can get the whole room and the number of people. Uh, so as you're setting up huddle rooms, the conversation to have is about how big is the table? How much social distancing do you wanna keep? Uh, how many microphones then might you need? Do you wanna have one display so that you are seeing content and people? Or do you wanna set up two TVs uh, so that one TV can be content and one TV can be uh, uh, the humans? Uh, so always thinking about you know the microphone piece to it, I have to say is really important. Uh, cameras are nice. Um, you could always turn on everyone's individual laptop cameras just without audio. Uh, but audio where people can't be picked up or heard uh, is, is really challenging for that hybrid employee that really isn't engaged in the meeting. Uh, we've used a number of devices. Uh, we have a full room Crestron set up here. We have the Teams uh, Lenovo uh, hub. We also have an OWL camera, OWL. Uh, like like the animal, hoo hoo. Uh, owl cameras uh, are automated. It's one camera you can put in the middle of the room. It has a 360 degree camera in it, and it automatically discovers who is talking and puts that person on camera, uh, and has all the microphone and speaker built into it. So there's just a variety of ways, and we have tried uh, a variety of these out uh, over the years in our own business, um, as we've always been kind of a hybrid workforce. Uh, but even now more than ever, there's more innovation going on and more feature set available. Uh, Teams is also coming out in Roadmap with a feature to, based on the size of the room, detect how many people are in the room and recommend somebody leave to maintain social distancing. So it can kind of count to the number of people. 
uh, and make sure that that's being monitored and managed, uh, as well as you know, Teams rooms, again, show up in Office 365 so you can see the calendar and you don't end up in a place where three, you know, three different groups are trying to walk into the one conference room uh, and say, oh, did you reserve it? No, oh, you didn't write it down on the sheet, right? You can do it all uh, with uh, calendars and Outlook that obviously can be seen by the entire team, whether they're remote or on site and on your mobile phone or in the web or in the you know, thick Outlook client. So lots of flexibility in hot rolling rooms with, uh, within Microsoft Teams, uh, which is also, you know, this experience for a lot of our clients has spurred them to think about, as well as COVID itself, uh, has thinking about what their phone and voice setup is. Uh, you know, in a year and a half, two years ago, we said Teams voice, meaning the actual phone system integrated into your Microsoft Teams and Office 365 experience, you know, wasn't quite yet ready for prime time as a phone system. Uh, but now as people have had to go into pandemic work from home, where maybe they only had their cell phone available to them, more and more our clients are saying, you know what, I think the integrated experience, the flexibility of being able to call from anywhere, no matter where our employee is and have that number ring and work. Uh, and people just kind of being tired of buying, you know, $300 desk phones from a proprietary vendor. Uh, when we've already had to invest in HD cam USB cameras and maybe USB uh, microphones or headsets for all their employees anyway, you know, you really don't need a physical uh, phone. I haven't had a physical phone on my desk in years uh, and just use Teams calling to make the few traditional phone calls uh, to landlines that I need to make. Otherwise, um, you know, I'm mostly on Teams meetings anyway. And then Teams automatically with that voicemail, they're, they're trans Microsoft is transcribing that voicemail, they're attaching it, you can get it in Teams in the app, as well as you can dial from your cell phone. Uh, so you can open the Teams app on your cell phone and dial out of there, and it won't pass your cell phone's caller ID. It'll pass your work number's caller ID out of Teams as well, giving that single number reach and single phone number experience that allows maybe the business to control the phone number their clients see, the business to own that phone number inside of their Office 365 tenant, and also solve that challenge of maybe we had salespeople that were handing out their cell phone that they get to take that cell phone number with them if they leave or retire, and now clients are calling that cell phone instead of calling uh, into the business numbers. Uh, so all these good collaboration things to think about uh, and particularly when it comes to voice and that need for collaboration in that way. Other things that COVID kind of changed forever was the adoption rate of VPN or remote desktop, virtual desktop uh, and laptops versus desktops. You know, the other thing our my VCIO team is we're doing three-year technology plans for our clients. We're always talking about kind of that, what is the, you know, what are the devices that are in the fleet today? Uh, and our recommendation had been, if you can use a desktop, use a desktop for an employee. Uh, you get an, probably an extra year of life out of them at least uh, over a laptop. They don't go through the same wear and tear being picked up, dropped, left in uh, airports and things like that. Now that's really changed. Uh, I was just on a call uh, with a client, you know, a couple of weeks ago that had just gone through and done an acquisition here during COVID. Uh, and so they were gonna need to swap out the fleet of devices that that uh, company that was acquired was using. Uh, and the, the discussion changed. I said, I, I know that desktops seem like they make more sense in a manufacturing environment, but, but what if? What if you needed that team to work from home or be more productive or work from anywhere? You know, having a laptop with a docking station and that docking station having the USB microphone, the camera, the monitors that they can come in, dock their laptop, close the lid and be able to be fully functional and then pick that off the docking station and, and work from home as well uh, in a pinch. It may, that is the new normal uh, because we saw the challenges that everybody went through when they kind of went, oh shoot, everybody's desktops are at the office. We don't really want them taking those devices home and trying to plug them in. Uh, and they won't have wireless because they're a desktop and all those sorts of other challenges. So um, really maybe more mobile devices uh, are be, you know, becoming the norm. Uh, and then just kind of the remote technologies to keep people enabled uh, to be able to do their job from anywhere. Uh, you know, I think are things that are here to stay and probably need to go through a second round of innovation because the first round was just making it work and now it's about optimizing it, improving it, budgeting for it, and making maybe a three-year plan uh, for how to manage that. You know, think about backup and 
uh, even asset tagging. We did a short presentation on asset tagging as people return to work is a great time if you weren't doing asset tags and all the devices that you sent home with your employees as they come back, at least tag and inventory them. So if we ever need to work from home again, we kind of know what device and where. You know, levity uh, comes from the words elevate and security. So we'd be remiss if we didn't evaluate how security played into uh, work from home environment. Uh, there's evidence that working at home has increased the risk of ransomware attacks significantly. Uh, it's an increase due to the combination of kind of weaker controls uh, in home IT and a higher likelihood of users clicking on COVID-19 themed ransomware and lure evals. Again, with that anxiety level being high, people aren't making the same quality level decisions at all times. And, you know, an email offering information about vaccines that are in short supply or hand sanitizer really had a run of being successful uh, and bringing in ransomware. We also kind of over the last uh, four to six months have seen a rise in a new form of ransomware called double extortion ransomware. So ransomware typically encrypts all your files on the network uh, and then offers, locks your screens and says, if you would like your data back unencrypted, go here and pay this amount in Bitcoin. And you either are stuck in a really bad spot uh, because it got through all your layers of security uh, and you're now left to look at your DR uh, and backup strategy to bring those files back or pay the ransom. Uh, typically that has just kind of been it. And if you can restore over the, the clean data prior to the ransomware event, you can get your business back up and running. Unfortunately, now we're seeing a rash of where uh, these ransomware tools are actually taking a copy of all your data out first, then encrypting everything that is on your network. And they ask for a ransom to unencrypt un it. And then they ask for the ransom to be doubled and pay it again. You're not out of the woods. They want that again, or they will take the unencrypted copies that they exfiltrated from your network and threaten to release that private information, risking your business's reputation, your client's information, uh, maybe regulatory bodies. Uh, so it's, it's you know not enough anymore, unfortunately, to just assume ransomware. Uh, is an isolated event where no data was exfiltrated. Uh, now that we're starting to see that, and this was from a KPMG study that was done uh, here really recently. Uh, these new ransomware lures just to talk about with your team uh, as a part of your ongoing security education, which you hopefully have, uh, hopefully every month, you're providing some IT security uh, training and information to your employees. If not, reach out to us and we can help with that. Uh, but new lures include, uh, include, you know, like I said before, information about vaccines or commodities like hand sanitizer, financial scams, offering payments around, you know, these uh, COVID relief bills, uh, free downloads uh, about technologies like video and audio conferencing platforms, ones that promise, you know, magic things that remove uh, background noise from dogs barking or things like that. Uh, and then just critical updates uh, and we're gonna kind of talk about that a little bit on the next slide, just the, just the boom in vulnerability reports that have come out, uh, which also is a problem in and of itself, but then the communications around it can be confusing and lead people to accidentally find themselves on fake Office 365 status pages, login pages, et cetera, where they're providing their credentials. So, you know, our feeling and the, the thing that we wanna leave you with, uh, unfortunately, is that security is always an escalator and it's moving the wrong way. Uh, and 2021 is worse. Uh, there's just some trends we're seeing that are super concerning. In an area that was already where the bad guys uh, were winning, uh, that percentages wise, just according to the data, uh, is getting much, much worse. Uh, so there's 20,000 new vulnerabilities reported, uh, or vulnerability reports predicted in 2020, that's just completely shatters. And so vulnerability reports or CVEs are when uh, security researchers and governmental bodies find known gaps in existing products that are out there in the market. Yeah, this just number is just astronomically larger than in previous years. Uh, there's been a 50% increase in mobile vulnerabilities, uh, just reminding people that you know, one of the points of entry can be a cell phone. Uh, ransomware has obviously, like I said, uh, you know, really thrived during COVID-19. Uh, with some samples saying that it's uh, increased by as much as 72% on an already high number. Uh, and then attacks on critical infrastructure, obviously, around healthcare, the research labs have really added to the chaos. There's been a 106% increase in new ransomware variants and 128% uh, increase in new Trojans, which are, you know, uh, 
malicious code that comes in. All of this predominantly comes in over email, which is why continuing that security training is really important. Uh, and again, people predominantly at home, they're not around their coworkers where their coworker can kind of lean over into the cube or office next to them and say, did, did you get that offer about that free Caribbean cruise? I, I don't think we should click on that. Um, you know, that's all virtualized now. So if you're, uh, hopefully some of today's conversation spurred some thoughts about maybe how, how to bring the team back and how to encourage and enable a hybrid workforce while kind of maintaining that awareness to this change for people the, and the anxiety related to it. Uh, and then hopefully we didn't add too much new anxiety as you think about where the direction of security is going, uh, but we're here to help. And uh, you know, whether you're an existing client uh, or one that's interested in learning more about what Levity has to offer. Uh, we always start everything now, uh, now and uh, with a T360. Our technology management 360 is a comprehensive review of your organization, your stance and readiness for hybrid office, as well as security threats, um, as well as that whole fleet and fleet management and state of the state within your environment, patching against those 20,000 new vulnerabilities that have been found. Uh, it also dives into your organization's IT operational maturity level, your strategy and roadmap for IT. Uh, so it's a really comprehensive, you know, technology management approach. And I know a lot of our competitors and others will say they'll provide you an assessment. That assessment is just enough to find out what to sell you. This goes well beyond that. We are, you know, your strategic IT partner. And that starts with uh, knowing where your business is going and aligning IT to the business strategy. And so we talk mostly about strategy and security. And the solutions and support we provide you are always going to be best in class uh, because that's what our organization does. But we do that all through the lens and with the enablement of our dedicated team of virtual CIOs and our strategy, all rooted in the recommendations from our emerging uh, solutions group that I manage uh, here at Elevity. We are meeting constantly. We are evaluating new technologies. We're evaluating some really exciting stuff when it comes to security. And then we'll bring that to you into the market uh, and help you adopt that and go through the next phase in your digital transformation. So please do reach out to us uh, and myself. I'll have my contact info on the last slide as well. If you have any questions, uh, comments, concerns about return to work, IT security or IT strategy, uh, know that we're here to help. So if you're joining us live, uh, please complete our little quick webinar survey. Either use your camera uh, as you open your camera app and just, uh, you don't have to take the picture, but just as you move your mouse over the QR code, uh, it'll suggest uh, launching to our type form or go ahead and type in form.typeform.com forward slash two forward slash FPIC. Uh, looks like an L23Z uh, and I'll give people just a minute to uh, type that all in. Uh, but fill out a very short survey. Let us know you were here uh, for a chance to win a $20 Amazon gift card as a thank you for uh, spending some of your time with us this morning. Lastly, again, like I said, if you have any questions, uh, feel free to reach out to myself, Paul Hager at phager at elevityit.com. So thanks again for joining us this morning. Uh, thanks for some of your time, your continued business if you're a client of ours. We hope everyone is staying safe and con considering the safest way to bring their workforce and collaboration back uh, to full strength. Uh, we appreciate you and uh, hope that you have a great rest of your week. Thanks for joining us.